The Big Bang for American soccer in this country was Bethlehem Steel. Without Bethlehem Steel, we might not be talking about soccer. Originally, the players were just regular steel workers. When Bethlehem Steel made the commitment to have a company team, he was bringing over the best players from one of the best soccer playing nations in the world. The bottom line was they started winning every time they played. Bethlehem Steel was the first super team in American soccer. They were the New York Yankees. They helped put soccer on the map. Bethlehem Steel were one of the proudest names in U.S. soccer. I don't think there was any other second choice besides going with Bethlehem Steel FC when we decided to put the team there in 2016. I always thought that my future would be coaching soccer. By 1979, the Pennsylvania Stoners were formed playing out of Allentown. Willie was very forward thinking. The model that the Stoners established is the model that MLS is finally getting around to today. Youth soccer in the Lehigh Valley is growing. You know, soccer's been here. What Bethlehem Steel started, we still see today. Bethlehem was a pretty interesting place, particularly given the river dividing it in half. The north side was the old Moravian community, a commercial, a prosperous business middle class. But once you cross the river, it was dominated by industry and Bethlehem Steel and the zinc works and the immigrants who came over. Archibald Johnston, the first mayor, said there were 64 ethnic groups in South Bethlehem which if you divided that by the population, might have made it the, the community with the you know, greatest immigrant group per capita of practically any city in the United States. It was atypical in one important sense in that it had Bethlehem Steel, which was one of the biggest employers of individuals in the state of Pennsylvania. It was a thriving company. At the time, it was one of the biggest companies in the world. Bethlehem Steel was the number two steel producer in the United States behind U.S. Steel. The thing that kept it busiest particularly during World War I and World War II, was manufacturing munitions. During the war, uh, the Bethlehem plant ended up having about 30,000 workers working here in a city of, what, about 70,000 people at the time. But it was an amazing just domination of the entire community by what went on in the Bethlehem Steel plant. Bethlehem Steel's revenues in 1914, the first year of World War I, were 47 million. The last year, there were 452 million. The corporation just skyrocketed. And in 1904, Charles Schwab, who at the time was president of U.S. Steel, bought Bethlehem Steel for himself. And he decided he was going to turn Bethlehem into a large, diversified steel manufacturer. Soccer got started in, in Bethlehem in 1904 when someone brought a ball over from Scotland. Originally, the players were just regular steel workers. In 1907, Bethlehem Steel started the company soccer team. It wasn't even called Bethlehem Steel at that point. It really was kind of a pickup team. And the team played every Saturday against Allentown. As time went by, though, as soccer started to grow in the area, largely because more immigrants were coming over to work, not just in steel industries, but in textile mills and things like that. Uh, they were bringing the game with them. It got more popular. Schwab seems to have seen football and the athletic program generally as something to occupy the, the workers and lessen the possibility of strikes. They played the team from the Homestead Mill in Pittsburgh, where Schwab had once been the superintendent, which had had a, a famous strike. He seems to have taken a page from Homestead's book. He saw how Homestead had used athletics to dissuade the workers from striking. I mean, working in a steel mill was always hot, dirty, and dangerous work. Schwab was making them work on Sundays, and he wasn't paying them any overtime. The workers could tell that the owners of the factories were making a lot of money where they were not. In 1910, there was a strike. The workers decided they wanted to hold out for a slightly higher wage. They wanted Sundays off. 
and they wanted a, an improvement to a, a bonus system that was in place that just made them work too hard. The strike lasted over 100 days. In the end, there was no resolve. The workers went back to work. There was no union, there was no contract, there was no agreement. The 1910 strike, I think, really embarrassed Schwab. Uh, he liked people to like him. He was a very charismatic leader, and he was embarrassed when the federal investigation uh, of the strike showed how poor the wages were at Bethlehem Steel. So I think one of the things Schwab wanted to do was what we now call welfare capitalism. Schwab decided it was time to start offering employees distractions that might keep them happy in lieu of pay. Schwab started a pretty aggressive athletic program, baseball, softball, and what wound up growing into a much bigger thing, a soccer team. My dad was a kid in a Scotland and was a handball player, a wrestler, and was very competitive, but decided that uh, America was better for him and he came over here when he was about 20 years of age. He was just an unbelievable guy. I am Larry Sheridan, the son of the great Billy Sheridan, who was the coach, manager, trainer for the Bethlehem Steel Soccer Club. Started coaching wrestling at Lehigh, and during his coaching career, a short two years, he received a call from an executive at Bethlehem Steel, R.A. Lewis. Uh, Billy, he said, uh, would you uh, like to manage our athletics here at Bethlehem Steel? Lots of companies had semi-professional sports teams that played in industrial leagues. That also probably drew pretty good crowds on the local level. Could be seen even as a gift to the community. The main driving force behind the Bethlehem Steel soccer team was a man named Edgar Lewis. He was executive vice president and was making almost $400,000 a year. And having a major corporate executive looking out for the team's interests in the executive suite was a great benefit to the, to the Bethlehem Steel soccer team. There were very few factory teams that had that kind of pull among the executives. He convinced Charles Schwab, who was in Sherman, that we should make this team professional. A grant of $15,000 from Schwab or from the corporation, one and the same, in 1915 was what really got the team rolling, got them to change their name from the Bethlehem Football Club to the Bethlehem Steel Football Club. Part of Charles Schwab's big commitment to making the team fully professional in 1915-16 included building Steelfield. It was nominally built for the athletic programs. That's how Schwab could justify spending the money on it. But I don't think there's any doubt. He built it for the soccer team. And it was, at that time, without question, the best soccer field in the country. Level playing field, well manicured grounds. The actual original seating complex still stands. It was made with Bethlehem Steel. The most distinguishing feature of that field is the grandstand, is the concrete grandstand, and that was built in 1915 for Bethlehem Steel. The steel company bought the land from Moravian College. It's now back in Moravian's hands, and they did engineering studies and discovered that it was built so solidly. Tearing it down would have been prohibitive. They've built around it, they put turf in, all of that, but the, the bones of that stadium and, and where the original seating was still stands today, you know, 100 years later. Once the decision was made that Bethlehem Steel was going to be an actual pro team, naturally the thought went to, well, where can we get players? While we all tend to think of England as the ground zero for soccer, Scotland was actually the better soccer playing country, and so one went to Scotland. Part of that was my father they would ship him over to uh, the British Isles and talk to players and say, how would you like to come to America, work for a major corporation, and uh, play soccer for Bethlehem Steel? I don't think any of them turned them down. Billy Sheridan, with his Scottish background, was, it was a perfect scout. It was easy to lure players away from their home country because these were individuals who were playing soccer full time at a weekly wage of about $25 a week. You know, Bethlehem Steel could say, hey, come to America and I'll pay you $75 a week 
uh, not just to play football, you'll nominally be working in a factory, but you're tripling their income and allowing them to continue to play football. It was a pretty good deal for those players. And then they had a nucleus of some fabulous players. It only happens in America. He gets off the boat, two years later he's at Penn, and the next year he's at Lehigh, and two years later he's managing athletics at Bethlehem Steel. He was coach, trainer, or manager, whatever picture you saw. He had three different titles. So he had an innate ability to manage and put things together. The team itself would have reflected, at least tactically, what you saw in the era. It was, uh, they, they were playing with five people up front, three midfielders, and two fullbacks. What he also had, though, was a group of better conditioned, better game shape, for want of a better way to phrase it, because his team was really pretty much the only full-time pro team playing. They were all from different parts of the world. You bring them over from Scotland, brought a few over from Ireland, and they all had different outlooks on how to play the game. Soccer, even then, was an international game, and, it, and, and in many ways, uh, the issues you had to confront were no different than what uh, a coach of a club team has to deal with now. The bottom line was they started winning every time they played. Bethlehem Steel was dominant during their run. They were utterly dominant. Just during Sheridan's run as manager, he had a record of 162 wins, six losses, and 12 draws. And the wins, they weren't close. He was bringing over the best players from one of the best soccer playing nations in the world. You saw a strong, athletic, but also talented team. It wasn't just brute force. And as a result, guided them to their earliest successes, winning American Cups, winning Open Cups. Bethlehem Steel was the first super team in American soccer. They were the New York Yankees. Back then, they were the example everyone wanted to follow. It provided something that all the sports when we were first becoming professional and growing in this country needed, and that was a dynasty. That was a villain, the team everyone loved to hate. It just so happened that in the roughly 20 years that they played, they, they amassed five national championships in the U.S. Open Cup. And even in the years when they weren't in the finals, they got to the semifinals. I mean, they were consistently dominant. At this point, even though they haven't played in over 100 years, they still have won combined the most amount of U.S. Open Cup championships, which is something pretty cool and unique for the area. For one thing, having a nationally known soccer team is certainly good publicity. And it also put Bethlehem Steel on the international map. They were really the first American team to be invited to play in Europe and against the best players in that area. They just nonchalantly would win. In 1921, the powers that be decided, hey, the time is right for a truly professional league. And so the American Soccer League was formed. And the American Soccer League initially consisted of the most powerful teams from the New York and Northern New Jersey and Massachusetts, primarily Fall River area. It was a strong, dominant league for about 10 years. Players from Scotland came to play in the American Soccer League, and it wasn't just for the money. Not coincidentally, with the arrival of the ASL, Bethlehem stopped winning cups as freely as they had prior. Fall River was winning ASL titles. Bethlehem Steel was important in showing that uh, high-level soccer could be entertaining, popular, and could bring people into the stadiums. That league did not exist if there wasn't a Bethlehem Steel around to make the concept of that league attractive. In 1928, 29, uh, the soccer war broke out. Over which was to be the controlling organization of the sport in this country and did a considerable bit of damage, which could have been repaired, except that a week after it was settled, the stock market crash happened. American soccer might have survived the soccer war if it had not been for the depression, and it might have been survived the depression if it had not been for the soccer war, but the double whammy was too much. The fans who were coming to games were very working class. Again, baseball was still an upper class sport. People were showing up to games in suits and straw hats and dresses. Working people were going to soccer games. Working people were losing their jobs. Lewis left Bethlehem Steel in winter of 1930. The Bethlehem Steel soccer team was disbanded pretty quickly after he left, just a matter of six weeks or something. It was kind of a perfect storm of, of bad luck 
that wound up driving Bethlehem Steel out of the soccer business and the original American Soccer League shortly thereafter. While it's fair to say that Bethlehem Steel achieved its greatest successes at a time when no one else was really trying, that should not detract from their accomplishment. They weren't all that dominant in the ASL, but they won cups. They were the national champions in an era where that really meant something. They helped put soccer on the map. It speaks to a different era in America when we were making things, when we were the industrial giant and Bethlehem Steel was right there. And this particular industrial giant decided to invest in a sport that was brand new to people and in some ways is still new today. I think that's part of the story that really intrigues people. I, I always thought that my future would be coaching soccer. My whole family, my parents, my father, my grandfather, my cousins, uncles, everybody played soccer. So it was in my blood. The Russian came into Hungary and beat on the revolution, and I was involved with the revolution committee in the area and in the factory, and I had to escape. And uh, I escaped with my wife overnight. We came to Austria, and from there, we came to America. Willie Ehrlich was a professional soccer player in his native country of Hungary, who came over to this country and uh, settled in the, in the Lehigh Valley area and promptly got involved in youth soccer. The first time I went out to junior high school practice, I saw that the coach is practicing like a football practice with the soccer players, and that was the first time I got involved with soccer in Pennsylvania, in Bethlehem, in fact. And I saw the, the way they approached the soccer, I tried to make the changes. Being familiar with the European style of things, had the dream of forming a true soccer club, one that wasn't just a franchise getting players when they could, but one that would develop its own players. It started off having a uh, high school team adopted from Freedom, Liberty, uh, Alonsan schools, two of them. And with the arrival of Pele in 1975, the North American Soccer League started to boom and a rising tide will float all boats. The American Soccer League started to get bigger. Developed the junior team, which was probably at that time would be the best junior team definitely in this area, but one of the best in America. And so by 1979, largely due to the efforts of Willie Ehrlich, paid what was a record sum for the American Soccer League, paid a half million dollars, and entered the Pennsylvania Stoners in the American Soccer League. The team was made up largely of Lehigh Valley players who had had success in college. He sprinkled that with a handful of seasoned professionals he was bringing over from Europe. He had connections in Hungary. And the first year we were number two in the league, the second year we won the championship of the American Soccer League. Willie Ehrlich's vision paid off, not just in a title, but both in 1979 and 1980, he was named ASL Coach of the Year. That was only the second time anyone had ever won back-to-back -back Coach of the Year awards from that league. And again, this is a league going back to 1930. And, and the team averaged about 4,000 a game. In a league, the American Soccer League, that was only drawing about 3,000. The team's success is on the field, and the team's relative success at the gate was simply not enough to, to keep it financially stable. It was a bad time for professional soccer in North America, and the Stoners were a casualty of that. The fact is, Willie was very forward-thinking, and it's not coincidental that the model that the Stoners established starting in 1974 is the model that MLS, you know, now almost 40 years later, is finally getting around to today and that is, you've got to develop your own players. And Willie was doing that at a time when no one else was thinking of that. They were the first American team to have corporate sponsorship on their jerseys. He had Alpo in 1980. No one else was doing that yet. He recognized that as a revenue stream. So the Stoners need to be better remembered as a, a very forward-thinking team, as the very template that's being followed today. And one of the nice byproducts of MLS's success, greater than the ASL of the 20s, greater than the North American Soccer League, is that it's driven people to want to go back and learn about the stories of the players that came before.
the Philadelphia Union, when we decided that we we're going to have a team play in the USL as our, our basically USL affiliate, we decided that we did want to have the team up in the Lehigh Valley. And at that point, it was pretty much the same dunk decision to name it Bethlehem. It's a name that carries a lot of history. At the same time, it's very original for the sport. I don't think there was any other second choice besides going with Bethlehem Steel FC when we decided to put the team there in 2016. It was nice to see that an MLS team recognized that and said, you know, we can have a reserve team, we could call it Philadelphia Union B, or we can honor um, you know, the, the, the teams that help make what we're doing now possible. Even before we put a team up in the Lehigh Valley, um, we were paying homage to the fact that Bethlehem Steel were one of the proudest names in U.S. soccer. So we had a third kit that was inspired by and, and based off of uh, the Bethlehem Steel back from when they played in the early 1900s. The popularity of that jersey, it's probably still one of the two or three most popular jerseys we've ever had. I think the goal that the Philadelphia Union had with this team was to say, what better way to create a team than out of the, the history of the steel? And we're paying homage to that history that everybody has in the Lehigh Valley. Bethlehem Steel and, and this USL project is very important for the organization, the Philadelphia Union as a whole. Bethlehem is the link between our academy, our high school, and the Philadelphia Union, the highest professional levels. Putting the team in Lehigh Valley, we were hoping to keep the team relatively local. Even though it was inconvenient to have a reserve team, you know, 90 minutes up the turnpike, nevertheless, initially placed that team in the Lehigh Valley. Yeah, I was at the first game. The response was, was fantastic. There was 6,000 people or so at the game. The community was really poised to embrace them. And I think had they had a little bit more time to get their feet underneath them from uh, the standpoint of, of building the foundation of the team, and had they had a little bit better uh, stadium environment that they could have played in, and lights played a big part of that, it would have really helped them drive larger attendance, which probably would have kept the team up here in the long run. And even though they're currently not there, you know, the long-term goal is to return that team to the Lehigh Valley, because the Lehigh Valley deserves professional soccer, and Bethlehem Steel deserves to be remembered. The stadium struggle has been the biggest challenge for them, is finding a 5,000-seat stadium with lights that they could host their matches at. And if they could find that, I think they'd be back in a heartbeat. Plenty of height on it, it's gone through. Germany scores! Having been to those viewing parties in Germany and having been to professional matches in France, the, the passion and, and just everything that goes on around those matches and those experiences is, is just mind blowing. About two years before the World Cup in 2014, when it was played in Brazil, I started talking about, I think we could host something like that here. One thing that was important to me now, working at ArtsQuest for a couple years, was it would have to be more than just soccer, though. It would have to be cultural. So that's where we really started building this World Cup viewing party and festival. And we're like, oh, is this gonna work or not? But then we got to that first Saturday afternoon and we had three pretty good matches and we had a couple of former national team players here, the Philadelphia Union were involved and they were doing a clinic for kids. That's when we knew we, we had something. There was three or 4,000 people here that day and it was just starting to build momentum. We are the U.S. We are the U.S. Mighty, mighty U.S. Mighty, mighty U.S. That first match when USA played Ghana, it was on Monday night. By game time, there were 7,500 people here. The energy, the noise and everything was insane. In less than five minutes to... Towards the end of the match, U.S. scored go-ahead goal. It's the, it's the substitute, John Brooks! The place erupted. <laughs> That's ultimately what took off for us. What was really neat for me is a Sunday afternoon, you had a bunch of folks here that are from Columbia that have moved here, and they're sitting next to a family of, you know, Parkland Soccer Club families. And the kids are playing together, and one might not even speak English, one might not speak, you know, Spanish, but they're interacting, they're smiling, they're hugging, they're having a great time. And that was that cultural thing that this campus was designed for. And soccer was a metaphor to bring people from a variety of cultures together with Soccer Fest, I think it has evolved into something that people within the know or within the soccer community now come to expect, and they want to come down to Steel Stacks because of the passion for the game from a variety of places 
And that's where all these different cultural things that we did for it gave more people an opportunity to enjoy an experience, whether they had a low level of knowledge and they just heard this was cool, or they've been the biggest passionate fan for 40, 50 years. They call soccer the beautiful game, and there's a reason for that. You can not know anything about the game at all and watch these players run. You can watch them leap. You can watch what they do with the ball, the skills with their feet, with their chest, with their heads. Everybody wants to play, and here's a game that doesn't require much more than something to kick. With Steele's success was the realization that, again, we're going to need to create our own players. Because of that, you saw youth soccer start. The EIBL Youth Soccer League, we're now celebrating our 40th, and we've had a good cadre of, of core clubs that have grown along with us. The Lehigh Valley is contributing to the soccer community and just the success and the passion around it, I think begets itself and is just bringing in more kids at an even younger age. I mean, four, five, six year olds are starting to play soccer now. We're getting a lot of good parent volunteers to helping out with the kids and eventually becoming coaches and some of them even percolating into the referee realm. We've got a lot of people that have a lot of soccer knowledge and they want to pass it along. Good ball. Good Starting in the 70s, we probably had four soccer clubs in Lehigh Valley. Today, we've got 45 clubs. We've got more than 3,000 kids just in the league alone, and there are leagues all across the state seeing that same type of growth. The women's game, because of the success of the women's team, has also grown tremendously. And it's probably the greatest growth area for everyone. You want to make it accessible to all, and if, if we do that, more and more kids are going to continue to play and those that find it to be the thing for them are gonna have a great opportunity. A variety of clubs at a variety of different levels to really enjoy playing that game. I love it. I mean, to me, seeing that kind of growth, it just warms the heart. The more kids get an opportunity to express themselves, to be engaged physically, if you're in a great experience in a great environment, then you're going to want to continue to play. Youth soccer in the Lehigh Valley is growing and there's more passionate soccer leaders than ever before. The neatest thing that for me has been to discover how many quality players there are around here. This area is one of the hotbeds of soccer in the country. There's so much good talent coming out of here and we're starting to keep it in, we're starting to make higher level teams so that the top talent stays here. And eventually I can see us getting a stadium for to hold a team of that level, of that second level of the MLS. Soccer's been here. What Bethlehem still started, we still see today. The kids grow up with a lot of soccer players. A lot of young girls playing soccer, which never known before. That all comes from the earlier development, in, and I think that the soccer today in America it has a very strong basis. Here we are, 2019, talking about a team that was in its glory over 100 years ago. The Bethlehem Steel soccer team of 100 years ago is something that I wish more people in the Lehigh Valley did know about. They're a, a famous shining light. Bethlehem Steel is one of the oldest and proudest soccer franchises that really existed in U.S. soccer. The Big Bang for American soccer in this country was Bethlehem Steel. When people were starting to embrace the concept of soccer as a professional game in this country, Bethlehem Steel provided that goal that other teams uh, could look to and follow. Without Bethlehem Steel, we, we might not be talking about soccer, and that remains their legacy.